Hello and uh, good evening. Well, good evening, uh, good morning, or um, good afternoon, depending on on what point you've you've logged in and are joining us. Uh, welcome to the third in this semester series of Core in Action um, talks. These are our close readings of the seminal work, The Embodied Mind, chapter by chapter. And uh, this week we will be joined by Ezekiel De Paolo, who will introduce us to chapter nine. Um, evolutionary path making and natural drift. Um, this is a, a chapter with a heavy payload, I think. Um, sort of we have we have reached the point back in the, the first session of our last semester when we first started our walk through the book. Um, I noted that the embodied mind is often not so much a book that you simply read as one you grind to a halt somewhere in. And it is this chapter I will sort of throw my hands up and confess on my first run through the book, this is the one that bested me. This is the, the chapter I had to pause, take a break from, and come back to at a later time. Um, and you might ask, actually, well, Marek, what, what was it about this one? As it happens, this is, this is an odd chapter to stop, because uh, there's not really anything in here that isn't already in the previous chapters. In the, the first... Um, six to seven chapters, we had all of our illusions stripped away, all of the, the basic foundations that we would have grounded a cognitive science in taken away as simple frames of reference and a need for a more dynamic and um, sort of negotiated frame of reference um, clearly outlined. Um, indeed, in the, the previous chapter, uh, in, uh, if you go back a, a session to the talk by Valérie Bonneurel, we were introduced to the concept of inaction, of co uh, cognition as embodied action itself. And in, in that chapter, the, the positive account of how we do a cognitive science without a simple foundational realism underlying it is first laid out. And all of the, the basic ingredients of what are in this chapter nine are already pretty much set out there in chapter eight. The idea that there is no God's eye view, there is no view from nowhere, there is no canonical description of the universe from which we can derive any and all truths that we might want to investigate or confirm. Um, rather, that every observation that is made is made by an observer, and therefore the observer has to be included in your description of the process by which you, you make the observation. Or, um, every distinction that is made is made by a distinguisher. And so any description of a distinction must perforce um, describe the process of distinction, just describe the, the embodied agent doing the distinguishing and how it is that the distinction itself is not something out there in the world ready to be picked up, but rather um, something that is sort of laid down in the, the like the path laid down in walking, it is enacted um, like a handshake or um, like going for a walk. What is it that chapter nine has that isn't any of that? And the answer is not an awful lot. Um, chapter nine doubles down on that. If we have a, a, a more traditional scientific bent, um, we might say we might retreat to a bastion to defend our point of view and saying, well, it's all very good to say that we must have, we must describe a, a distinguisher if we want to um, describe a distinction. But if we, believe the, um, the the conclusions that have been drawn by the theory of evolution, distinguishers are themselves created by distinctions. The way the environment is, the organization and the characteristics of the environment determine through the process of natural selection what kinds of animals can exist in that environment. And as such, we can get from a distinction to a distinguisher. That's where that's where we go. Um, in this chapter, the that sort of last gasp hope, which was introduced at the end of chapter eight, um, is again sort of systematically chipped away and removed. And I suspect it was just that um, last bit of solid ground being swept away somehow just did for me and I couldn't get my head around it. Um, took a while for me to go back, think, um, settle things down a little bit and, and come around for another pass. But it, this chapter does very much reward that second reading, I think, because in this chapter, what was introduced in the last is unpacked in more detail. Uh, we come round for a second pass at um, the, the issue of colour perception. We address the, the basic foundations of what it is to be a living animal engaging with its environment. 
and indeed co-arising with its environment and what that really means and how that is really entailed by the cognitive science that exists at present. Um, it's also a chapter that I have repeatedly come back to um, in my own work uh, because of the, the ways in which it engages both with um, evolutionary theory, um, with philosophy of science, with um, the sort of basic concepts of ontology, as well as uh, other aspects of cognitive science and other non-mainstream approaches to cognitive science. So there is a great deal to unpack in this chapter, and we are very lucky to have a, a guide as this path gets laid down in the walking um, who is uh, best suited to, to the task. Uh, amongst inactive researchers, this is a person who would um, need no introduction, and I'm very grateful and lucky to have been able to conduct my, my own doctoral studies in the, the same lab as, or in the, the same research center um, as Ezekiel Di Palo, our speaker for this evening. So um, Ezekiel is a, a, a research professor uh, working at ICAR Basque in the, the Basque Science Foundation in Spain, and a visiting professor at the Department of Informatics in the University of Sussex. Um, his interdisciplinary work on embodied and inactive approaches to life, mind, and society integrates insights from cognitive science, neuroscience, phenomenology, philosophy of mind, and computational modeling. His recent research focuses on inactive theory, embodied intersubjectivity, language, ethics, and participatory sense-making. Um, he is author or co-author of over, over 180 publications, journal articles, books, and edited collections, including the book Sensory Motor Life and an Active Proposal, and linguistic bodies, the continuity between life and language. And um, once you've got your heads around um, the embodied mind, there are um, few better second and third steps that you might take um, than those two books. Um, so the continuity, and so he, uh, he's also co-editor of the forthcoming annotated edition of Francisco Varela's Principles of Biological Autonomy, which I think is due for release in January, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that is one to look forward to, and that'll have a, that'll be a sort of a, a nice um, sort of chaser to the uh, core in action session on the topic. If you go back to uh, uh, the the first semester talks, um, there was a, a nice discussion of that work and the work um, evolving from it as well. So it'll be uh, it'll be very good to see that work brought back into the ongoing and the active discussion around an action. Um, so without further ado, I will. Um, hand us over to our guide through chapter nine for this evening. Uh, Ezekiel, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Marek. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Now. Um, can everyone see that? Yeah, all good. Can you hear me well? Yeah, okay. So thanks, uh, Marek. I, um, as I was Telling Marek earlier, this is a chapter in which one is very tempted to keep adding stuff. I had to restrain myself not to, you know, add some new research uh, on development or evolution that actually proves the point even better than what uh, was available in the 1990s. Um, so I, I did a little bit of that, but um, not too much. In fact, in this chapter, my in this presentation, my purpose is to try to give you um, enough elements to appreciate uh, the main messages of the chapter, and uh, and I'm not assuming that you are you have knowledge of uh, the evolutionary biology or developmental biology, but I will introduce some of the key ideas that are mentioned in the chapter because uh, overall they make an interesting argument that starts by being an argument by analogy, an analogy that uh, what's been going on before in the book, the criticism of computationalism and cognitivism, and what has happened in biology, uh, in the particularly in the 80s and 90s and of the last century, um, as the criticism of the adaptationist program. And, and the parallel is, is so striking that at some point you will start wondering if it is really a parallel or is it just the one phenomenon? As it's quite an interesting open question to me. Um, so this is chapter nine. Um, and as I said, we have this uh, theme of a parallelism between the adaptationist program in evolutionary biology 
and the computational view of the mind. Uh, in a way, uh, as Marek said, this will retell the story that has been told so far, uh, but in, in many cases, it's very fruitful retelling because it helps you uh, see more clearly or more concretely uh, some of the ideas that may have still remained a bit abstract. Um, the key criticism will be, you might summarize it under the concept of path making, which is the relation between organisms and their environment as a co-determined relationship, uh, a, a, his, a history of co-definitions, uh, mutual changes, breakdowns, and transformation. Um, and that is the key uh, message of the chapter. And in some sense, it's one of the key messages of the inactive approach, that organisms and their environments should not be thought as separate, uh, but as, as intimately linked or agents and behavior or cognizers on the world. Um, so that's going to be the core of, of the presentation. Uh, towards the end, the chapter takes a, a, a little bit of a sharp turn and, and starts saying, you know, just going through a, a series of messages and, and quick uh, recognition of other um, approaches um, in cognitive science, such as ecological psychology and uh, behavior-based robotics and i think what they do in that final part of the chapter is to give you a glimpse of what an inactive cognitive science looks like so, so there's a focus in, in many uh, parts of the books on, on philosophy and and but this is a chapter that i think is telling you this is the sort of the science that we can do uh with these ideas okay so um a lot of the discussion in, in this chapter concerning evolution, development, uh, is taken back, you know, is, is uh, picked up by Evan Thompson in his book, Mind and Life, again, and it's updated and it has more, more interesting detail. So it's nice to read the two together if you're interested in, in this connection between biology and, and, and action. So just very quickly, the history of evolution, um, I will tell you very briefly um, uh, the context from which we start, uh, and then the, what the adaptationist program was, and still is, and, and what the problems were with it. So in the end of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, wasn't a great time for the Darwinian uh, theory of evolution by natural selection. It was actually considered, criticized uh, from many flanks, and it was considered that maybe it really wouldn't work uh, as Darwin and, and Alfred Wallace have proposed. And their main problem was precisely that they lacked a theory of inheritance. And, and in fact, they kind of favor something that was called uh, the blending theory, when you have two, two organisms that share, you know, they, they have different uh, traits, one is taller, the other is shorter, and their offspring would be, you know, would have a height somewhere in the middle. And, and that sort of idea was problematic because uh, it tended to erase variation. And therefore, if natural selection was supposed to be the main uh, directive force in, in, in evolution, in explaining why novelty arises in biology, why species differentiate, and so on and so forth, uh, you wouldn't have enough variation to select from. And that was a problem. And in fact, uh, people like uh, who were looking at inheritance and the laws of inheritance, like Gregor Mendel, uh, but then in the in the early 20th century, um, people like William Bateson, the father of uh, Gregory Bateson, um, were considering that there had to be another explanation for the origin of species, and that natural selection would at most be some sort of pruning factor that that would just uh, remove everything that really didn't work but it couldn't really explain where the novelty came from. Now, it turned out that combining these two ideas was what saved, if you like, the idea of evolution by natural selection. And this is known as the modern synthesis. Uh, so a series of mathematical models involving uh, very simple assumptions about the distribution of uh, genetic material in a population and how that is uh, 
supposed to affect differentially the, the possibilities of uh, passing on that material to the next generation allowed us a series of, of very clear and convincing mathematical models um, by people like Ronald Fisher and Sewell Wright and GBA Saldane. Now, this in a way brought back the, 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 the you know, Darwinism and genetics uh, into this synthesis. And that was the beginning uh, of, of a, a fruitful period, at least for, for a while, uh, in which um, lots of um, questions in, in evolutionary biology could be explained using the assumption that they were they have been selected for by natural selection. Uh, one key aspect that is important here was uh, what is called Weismann's barrier, which is essentially that genes are passed on, uh, but any, any developmental changes uh, are not inherited in the next generation. So that will be a, a Lamarckian view of evolution. And that was sort of uh, also accepted uh, as, a, as a fact. And, and of course, there were experiments that showed that that seemed to be the case, obviously. Uh, it wasn't just simply an idea. Um, so this is the, the basis of, of this uh, way of looking at uh, evolution. And therefore, the, the question of how populations vary over time uh, ends up being a question of uh, in what way the, the differential reproduction that uh, is achieved by individuals uh, is due to their genetic inheritance. And therefore, and that, how does that genetic uh, distribution changes over time in populations? Now, uh, those mathematical models introduce the concept of fitness. Sewell Wright introduced the concept of a fitness landscape. Now, fitness, of course, is one of those, those, those ideas that there, there is some controversy about the, the, the best definition, but it's a measure of reproductive success. Um, it's defined as uh, the abundance of a genotype from one generation to the next in a stable environment, or sometimes as a measure of persistence, the, the avoiding the risk of not leaving uh, offspring in, in the next uh, generation. And this fitness landscape, which I, is often and um, contentiously idealized as uh, this, this sort of a, a mountain landscape where the height indicates your fitness value, you know, you will have more fitness if you go a bit higher, if you manage to go higher, and the horizontal plane will be your, your genotype. Now, of course, it's misleading because the, the horizontal plane is just two dimensional and genotypes are hundreds of thousands. So, uh, there's a problem there already with this visualization, but it kind of helped understand what was going on uh, and how to, to, to look at, at evolution. Now, selection could have, if you look at, at this curve as distributions of genotypes in, in a population, selection could be of different kinds. They could favor one extreme of that distribution over time and directional selection. They could stabilize that selection and keep, you know, that average more or less stable and, and narrow that, that peak and stabilize in selection. Or they could disrupt uh, the distribution in, into separate distribution, eventually leading to speciation. Now, uh, the big question, however, you know, Darwin, for Darwin, the unit of uh, evolution of selection was the individual organism. But there were all kinds of issues about how you explain certain kinds of behavior that might uh, be more easily or at least intuitively explained at the level of, say, groups of organisms. So there was a, a, there was the, the 50s and 60s of the last century, there was, a, if you like, a, a lot of speculation about uh, what the unit of selection might be. And there was a, a, a lot of... Uh, uh, ad, you know, advocates for the idea of group selection so that then you might explain things like altruism and things like that that were paradoxical at the level of individuals. Uh, well, the, you, guys, you know the rest of the story, perhaps the, the, uh, the reaction to that was a re-entrenchment in, into a, a reductionist view of what actually the unit of selection was. And uh, George Williams proposed that, in fact, uh, if 
it's not even single organisms that are the unit of selection, but uh, actual genes. And this actually can explain some kinds uh, of uh, seemingly altruist, altruistic behavior, for instance, if you are in such way benefiting others that are related to you. So you could explain, for instance, uh, parental care for the for offsprings, you know. Um, and this was popularized by Richard Dawkins in, in the 1970s with the idea of a selfish gene as a gene as the essentially a recipe that determines uh, a phenotype, but essentially with interested in replicating itself over in the next generation. Now, that's a little bit of the adaptationist program. The adaptationist program it, we involve a, this kind of thinking about what might be a characteristic that you're interested in in in, in biology, and say what well, what might the evolutionary explanation in selective terms, in environmental pressures that would uh, select for such a characteristic be like, and that would be more or less the way you formulate an explanation in terms of adaptation. Now, there are many issues with this, this program, and of course, some of them are, are not that uh, important in terms of that, that being you know, strong criticisms, uh, because they can easily be uh, assimilated by an adaptationist pr perspective. And I'm gonna mention in many ways because I mentioned in the chapter, I mean, what is the issue of uh, pleiotropy, which is there is no one-to-one -one mapping between genes and traits that are being selected. And so for instance, in the case of, uh, sickle cell anemia, this is caused by a mutation in a gene that produces all kinds of different problems. Uh, so in, in a way, uh, and, and in, apparent, in very different systems. Uh, so uh, if you were to read that uh, mutation as evidence of some involvement of that gene in the normal functioning of these different systems, it would be then the, the conclusion would be that that gene uh, is involved in many different uh, traits that are very far from each other. But it's, it's a big if, uh, you have to be careful there. And so I'm gonna may, may come back to that. Uh, it's all, the chapter also mentions linkage, which is the idea that genes that are, are structurally linked, for instance, they, 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 they tend to essentially be passed on to the next generation without, uh, without being separated. So, so the, there is no, no, no free search for the right optimization because some, some in, in a chromosome, in, a, in this case, in a sexually reproductive uh, reproducing species, if the genes are located very closely in the chromosome, they're likely to be just inherited as a pair. Uh, the chapter also mentions genetic drift, which is the idea that sometimes, you know, things just happen by bad luck you know the the variation in, in a population may be lost by by pure uh, uh effects that such as for instance an earthquake or the uh, the creation of an island that separates a population into two different populations and the distributions in the two different populations is very different from the original distribution because the populations were not very large to begin with and you would think like, well, okay, that's like noise. Yeah, but actually it, it is measurably a very important effect. And something that not mentioned in the chapter is the idea that many mutations, most mutations are neutral. They do not change anything. And in, especially in molecular e evolution in, in RNA, uh, in the 1960s, um, Moto Kimura, he proposed the idea that actually most, ev most evolution, most of the time is just a neutral, uh, exploration of neutral networks uh, in this space so that nothing really happens apparently and yet things are changing at the molecular level which cast some doubts on the idea of this fitness landscape that was like a nice nice mountain now you have something more like uh, a mixture of plateaus and mesas and buttes uh, where lots of fitness values are essentially the same and, and it seems that not, nothing really happens for a long time until something really catastrophic could happen. And this ties in with uh, proposals looking at the fossil record, at, at the change in different species over time, um, that show that, in fact, that these changes often are, uh, you know, periods of sharp 
uh, transitions mediated by periods of long stasis where organisms stay the same. And this is the idea of uh, punctuated equilibrium proposed by Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould. So if you see the, the, the little trees there, instead of gradualism, you had these jumps. Uh, why is that important? Why is that a criticism? You might think like, okay, well, fine, this jumps and not. Well, but the, the important part here is that then natural selection climbs down a few rungs in terms of importance as, as the, the mechanism for explaining evolution. And then you have to explain why that particular charm happened. It may have been a developmental process, it may have been a historical accident, and, and so on and so forth. So you have to bring structure, you have to bring dynamics, you have to bring history in, into the explanation. And you don't have this universal mechanism anymore. Natural selection is still active, but it is it's, it's not the main uh, explanatory factor. And that is important uh, to keep in mind. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould and, and Richard Lewontin are also famous for this paper, which if you're interested in, in this in this area, in this topic, and you haven't read this paper, I think you, you should, because it's, it's fantastic. It's actually called The Critique of uh, and the Adaptationist Program. Uh, well, it's, it's called The Spandles of San Marco and the Panglossian Paradigm. Spandrels are these triangular bits, and like in this basilica of San Marco, uh, there is a an image there in, in a circle. Uh, and their point was that this plays no structural role. It, it, it just simply is a byproduct of having the the the, the arches uh, oriented in a distance and way, and therefore. You would, you would never think that we must find a way to explain why they put spandrels in there. You know, in fact, there is no putting spandrels in there. Spandrels are a byproduct. In biology, one, a fun example of that is the human chin. Apparently, it has no function, but it, it, there, there are, you know, other, other hominids don't have it. So uh, it is a developmental spandrel, according to some. Anyway, that is the the the... the I would say the light critique is not so light, but in terms of the, an active approach, I think the real, the real meat comes now in what uh, the aspects of path making. And I'm going to look at evolution, development, and behavior. Now, uh, yeah, uh, they, these are mentioned in, in, the, in the book, and they are um, really key readings if you're interested in action. I would say, even if you're not interested in biology, Try to read some of the these these uh, articles or books by Richard Lewontin and Richard Levins. Uh, they are collected in in a couple of books: Dialectical Biology and Biology Under the Influence. Um, uh, I think that there have, this is you know if, if if this was a chapter where Marek was you know ground to a halt. For me, it was this was the moment the comparison that made me go, "Aha! Uh -huh, I get it now." So you, you, it, that's why I think this is important, at least has been for me. These people are saying for evolution very much what uh, Varela Thompson and Russia are saying for cognition. Now, what are they saying? Well, uh, hold on. I have to change the view so I can read the quote. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can do it. Um, well, sorry. Uh, to be able to well, essentially, if you can read that quote, I won't read it then. Uh, but the point that uh, you want, you want is saying in the chapter uh, previously published in the paper called The Organism as a Subject and Object of Evolution is that the main difficulty in the adaptationist perspective, where you are thinking uh, that the environment poses a problem and the population of organisms needs to adapt to that problem is that they assume that the, uh, these problems are pre-existent and that the environments and the organisms are separate. Uh, but he says, that's not actually the case. Uh, the environment is not externally imposed uh, on the organism, uh, but it's a creation of the population of evolving uh, organisms. And I would add many populations interacting in an ecosystem too. Uh, so just as there is no organism without an environment, there is no environment without an organism. And in what ways do organisms change their environment or in what ways do they participate in, in determining the environment? Well, they determine what is relevant 
the organisms, you know, they just don't care about absolutely everything that happens in the environment. Sometimes some things are going to be relevant for the particular species that they are, the particular history that they carry. Um, they also induce changes in the external world. They, 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 they essentially, we wouldn't have soil or oxygen and an at at atmosphere without oxygen if we didn't have the changes uh, that have been produced by life. So the, the environment is altered by, by organisms. They transduce the physical signals uh, in, in such a way that is relevant to, to, to the organism itself. This is very much like the case of color vision that was discussed the last time. Uh, not everything is going to be relevant. Uh, at this moment, we are all bombarded by, you know, radiation from radio waves, or the Wi-Fi connections and everything. We just don't feel them because when our sensory apparatus is not uh, attuned to that. With technology, that changes, of course. Um, organisms transform the statistical pattern of variation in the external world, which is another way of saying they, they modify the external world. They, 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 they make some things more stable. They make some things more, more variable. Um, and it is a relationship. And I like to use the word relationship. It's not just a relation. It's a, it's a history, a relation that is being played over a history between organism and environment that defines what is going to be selected, what is going to be relevant. So these are this is a, a, a key reading. And he even is very quite inactive in the way he describes things. He says that the nervous system is not attuned to the absolute laws of nature, but the laws of nature that operate within the framework created by our senses activity or by our activity. Uh, I cannot, this is very much something that could have been written in in this book uh, as a, as an as an inactive idea. Here's a proposal, and well, it was already written by Leontin there. Now this idea evolved after after the the publication of Embodied Mind, and today we talk about different processes, different like ecological inheritance or ecosystem engineering, or like uh, Kevin Leyland and Marcus Feldman and John Aldine Smay. Uh, they talk about niche construction. And that photo you probably cannot see because it's, there's a beaver there that has built a beaver net. That's an example of very clearly example of niche, niche construction, organisms altering their environment. But there are many, many more subtle examples. And the idea is then that over time, the process, the relation between environments and the population of organisms is not unidirectional, uh, that where the environment selects uh, puts some pressure externally uh, on the organism, but it's bidirectional. Natural selection does happen, but this construction also happens and alters uh, environments. And by their own dynamics, environments can uh, inherit or make stable certain aspects. Those beaver dams, I, well, I don't know how long they last, but I imagine that maybe more than one generation? I don't know. But you could imagine structures involving transgenerational, uh, the, the creation of transgenerational environments in which a new generation develops uh, thanks to that structure. So that's an ecological inheritance. Um, just to mention passing long time ago in you know galaxy far away, I used to work on this and I used to uh, do work on models of uh, evolution. And in all of them, perhaps instinctively, the, the point was, if you allow the environment to be altered by the, the evolving population, change, everything changes. And this uh, the, 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 the one in the middle with Matt Silver was the first uh, model of uh, the, the effects of space, the distribution of a population over space on niche construction. Um, so this this already was um, very very much in, in the way I, I was thinking, and maybe that's why I was very attuned to this chapter. Now, uh, today, and I'm going to flash some some things very quickly. But today, there are the people who are picking up on, on these ideas of niche construction and reflecting, in, in making new reflections on the meaning of uh, an active idea, such as bringing forth the world. And there's a really nice paper, recent paper by Giovanni Rolla and Ada Figueiredo. 
Um, these are just mentioned in passing. I'm not going to go into them. Every now and then there will be one just for you know in sharing. Um, um, the idea of having a, a niche that you're constructing, and in fact, an ecology itself, it, it is not new in, in cognitive science, even though it's still a bit, I would say, marginal. Uh, you know, it's not central, even though it's so obvious. And a key figure for that, I'm also just mentioned this in passing, is Ed Hatchins, who is an anthropologist looking at the, at the relations between interactions with your environment, with technologies, uh, and he has a very nice paper on a cognitive ecology. So here we have a, it's, it's a parallel between what niche construction uh, is for evolution and, and um, how it manifests at other levels too in development and, and cognition. Uh, I had to mention this because it was such a cute example from uh, a year ago or so. Apparently these spiders uh, can be shown to uh, use the spider web as as a sound antenna. They they, they use it as as uh, to hear uh, in in especially insects that, that are flying. They're particularly attuned to that frequency of the flying insects. And and this, this study shows how the different points in in, in the spider web vibrate, how the the the, the spider uh, changes behaviorally when when it, it can hear it or when it cannot hear it because the the the, the introduce modifications to, to, the, to the web and so on. So it's another case in which you're um, using your environment or you're creating your environment and changing it uh, according to your form of life. Now, in development, we have a similar story, and I'm going to mention very quickly the background to this story. Uh, so we have a, a, the, the work of Con Conrad Wallington was fundamental in understanding the importance of development as a process that is not just merely a byproduct of evolution, but it's actually uh, fundamental in creating and stabilizing these evolutionary novelties and, and, and in even changing the, the selective pressures. Uh, so he introduced this metaphor, and it's a, it is a metaphor, it's not exact, of the epigenetic landscape, where this ball would roll down, this ball representing a particular trait uh, of an organism, and the way that through development it would roll down and it would fall one, down one of these channels and be one of certain options. And, and the shape of the genes are changing the shape of the landscape. Change and the genes do not determine the outcome of this process, they're just the, the shape of this landscape. And the environment can produce shocks that can make you, you know, go from one uh, uh, groove into another. He called this genetic can uh, canalization. When that shock eventually ends up creating a groove, uh, genes are assimilating uh, an environmental change that was manifested developmentally. Almost sounds Lamarckian, but it isn't actually. Um, and another similar uh, way in which development and evolution interact is through developmental plasticity. And this, the Baldwin effect by James Mark Baldwin, it, it was a very important, uh, but often neglected um, effect that if you're able to learn, you're able to then cope with a variety of different problems that are not genetically, you're not genetically determined to already have the solution for them. You can look at me, I'm talking about problems again. And anyway, the, 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 the thing is that then you might uh, be able to find a new niche, a new selective pressure and so on by the fact that you move through learning, exploring the possibilities in your surroundings. Uh, and then that becomes relevant to you, which wasn't before you, you, you learned it. So there, there, there is an interesting loop between developmental plasticity and, and evolution. And uh, people like uh, Mary Jane West Everhart really has a very in-depth analysis of all these ideas. And this is a this is a really important book and is very, very thick. Um, now, in the chapter, this, uh, after looking at some cases of development, like the development of Drosophila, 
Um, it would take me too long to, to explain what the point is there, but the point essentially is that the genes do not determine what happens, but it's a whole kind of a dance, a chemical dance of uh, gradients of chemicals that tell some genes to activate here and over there, but the effect here is very different from the effect over there and so on. They go through that example, and then they, they look at um, some, some of the work by Susan Oyama, who uh, very lucidly was looking precisely again at the uh, relation between developmental organisms, uh, organisms in development and their environments as developmental systems, whole systems. So uh, she was critical of, if you like, the hylomorphic perspective in which form, you know, the shape of a trait or the shape of an organ is imposed on matter. But actually that she says it emerges from the reactivity of matter at different levels, at the level of cells, tissues, whole organisms. And, and at all levels, there is something that is changing and some surround, something surrounding it, some local environment. And these interactions are yeah, at all these levels creating the form. Uh, so they kind of be said that this this process is a simple transmission in the genes uh, uh, or in the environment. This is what in the int what's interesting. The, the the subtle twist here is that um, it it is a constructive developmental process in which you cannot just simply say, well, you know, it's eighty percent genetic, uh, twenty percent environmental as you often do, you know, using population statistics, you, you can try to, to make a story like this about inheritance, and it has been done, and sometimes in controversial ways, um, being partly environmental, partly um, inherited, the famous nature versus nurture uh, debate. Now, uh, she says, no, what happens is that some kind of, uh, again, a little dance is being created where little bits of matter are telling themselves each other, well, you, you are the environment to me. And no, no, we are together. And, and, or yes or no, a negotiation happens and therefore something takes shape, takes form. It is in hyphen form. And this is the, the meaning of information that... that uh, Particularly, Francisco Varela was very, very keen on on on, on promoting as an alternative uh, to, to the idea of traditional ideas of information, something that is informing, creating form, and this happens also a lot in principles of biological autonomy. For those who are interested, again, just flashing a note: there's a very nice recent paper on the connections between uh, an action and developmental systems theory that is Susan Oyama's uh, and others. Uh, in by Amanda Corris. Now, something that is not mentioned directly in Embodied Mind, but is mentioned in, in Mind and in Life, is of course, uh, you know, it it, uh, it can be seen as a further criticism, or which is the idea of symbiosis. And here, very briefly, again, I cannot go into much detail here. We have uh, Lynn Margulis as one of the main promoters in the 60s and then till the 80s and the 90s of the idea that uh novelty in evolution has happened uh, at many points through the coming together of different species and entering into symbiotic relations and this is for instance now very much acknowledged as the origin of the uh, organelles in the in the eukaryote cells for instance uh but today we talk a lot about this of so of course we talk about the microbiome uh I mentioned there that the, the, the human ratio seems to be one to one that is to say we have about as many human genetic cells as non-human genetic cells in our bodies and not 10 times more as they sometimes said uh but it's still impressive you know essentially half the number of cells in our bodies are not ours <laughs> or rather they are ours in, in a different sense um and there's a very nice study there that is also to me to my mind very inactive which is they look at the 900 species and they look at their gut microbiomes and and of course they find all these correlations that have to do with you know how close the species are to each other uh, there are shared environments and so on but they also find there's very large correlations between birds and bats 
So it seems to be a microbiome for flying things, which is quite quite curious. And it, there is no explanation for that. They they, they advance some some hypothesis, but one wonders if it is an, an inactive result of of having a lifestyle that produces such deep changes in your biology. Pure speculation at this moment, of course. Uh, so developmental symbiosis again is is fundamental uh and it's not mentioned in the book and i think it, it it adds to the kind of criticism that the book makes and and one of the first studies was by uh of this symbiosis of the bacteria and a species of um snot, snot squid um octopus octopus in hawaii was by margaret mcfall guy and, and she also has been looking at this idea of meta organisms uh, and going quickly through this because these are just merely presenting that they show you that these exist uh a whole movement in biology uh was called evo divo precisely bringing together developmental plasticity developmental symbiosis and but uh, people like Scott F. Gilbert say, actually, it should be eco evo divo. We have, you know, we have all, all, all relations with other species and niche construction on top and so on. So it's, it's very complicated. Now, to be fair, <laughs> are, are the, uh, what happens to, to the original adaptationist program? Well, many of the things I've said, they can they have incorpororated them in and in, in, in a fair manner uh especially biologists like John Maynard Smith uh it might be my bias as coming from Sussex but he 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 was on the one hand somebody you could you could find always in the middle of, of these debates trying to find a, a a reasonable middle point but always thinking as a scientist and uh I wouldn't call him an active at all, but you know, it, it, he says, "Well, we can incorporate some of these, these ideas." And they, uh, with Erasmus Mary, he, they wrote a really nice book called "The Major Transitions in Evolution," where they incorporate ideas about symbiosis, about developmental plasticity, and so on and so forth, while still kind of retaining a very adaptationist perspective, or at least suggest, suggesting that adaptationism is a good point to start. In, in explaining something in biology and then see where it breaks down. Now, on, on the ancient environment mutuality, it turns out that uh, John Maynard Smith was also uh, one of the, the key developers of the, in, the idea of introducing game theory into evolution, uh, into models of evolution. Now, this is very much the case in which you have populations and environments co-determine each other. The thing is that the environment is actually other other individuals in your population, such as when you play a game where there might be some stakes uh, and the way and the different strategies you may have. So it's interesting that frequency dependent selection it can to some extent be incorporated within the, the traditional uh, perspective as well. Uh, so it's not as like they were totally ignorant uh, of these ideas. Um, interestingly, uh, just to mention this in passing, uh, game theory, game theoretical situations like this sometimes create uh, loops where no particular strategy wins, but because it's like a rock, scissors, papers uh, relation between when one beats the other, beats the other, beats the other. And you could, and this has been uh, shown in this species of uh, side blotched lizards in California. And they're, they have, the males have different strategies and di different colors and so on. And they did, it's a long story, but essentially uh, the population actually oscillates. Now, again, it, this is just, uh, relevant thing that that I'm going to go into uh, evolution in four dimensions is a really nice book where you they try to condense many of the things I've been saying that there is genetic epigenetic uh, cognitive behavioral and even symbolic forms of inheritance and that that they they, they all uh, interact in complex ways and 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 this was written by Marion Lamb and Eva Chablonka. Again, just a recommendation. Now, is it all just an analogy? Well, let's see. Uh, 
this is where it gets a bit diffused in my mind because it is starts like an analogy. It says, see what happened there in biology? Well, this is what we meant to say for the, the for the case of cognition. But in fact, they 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 start blending into each other. Now it, it's very clear that adaptationism and computationalism, at least in their vanilla forms, have very strong analogies. So they have the assumption of an independent environment. They have a problem solving framework where whatever the organism either through evolution or through cognition must do is to try to find the right solution to what to do next. What is the right mutation or what is the right action? Uh, there, there is a sense in which if you have to try, if there is a better solution, that solution should be pre preferred. There's a sense of uh, optimality seeking. There are assumptions about modularity because you have to make this work somehow, and therefore you have to assume that you have internal mechanisms uh, that will select separate uh, traits that will additively or linearly adapt to the global solution. You can tweak with each of them independently or more or less independently, which are all, all the, the, the other, you know, the, the other uh, analogies. And of course, there's, there's a, a reductionism uh, implied in all of this. Now, these analogies, genes are real, some mental representations are imagined. That's what I think. I believe that the problem here is that adaptationism can self-correct because there is a sense in which the, the, the construct of a gene is associated with uh, 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 something that can be measured, manipulated, and so on and so forth. Doesn't mean that it can be understood, you know, by just mapping the human genome, we have not really cure any major diseases. So it, it does, it's not just simple as that, but it's true that what that brings, that knowledge brings is essentially that something else is going on with genes. And then we have to start looking at genetic regulation, networks, and et cetera, et cetera. So the, 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 there is a way in which we're dealing with something that can be studied scientifically. I don't believe that's the case with mental representations. And therefore, I believe that, OK, I'm making a bit an extreme case here, but never mind. Uh, you can quote me on this. Uh, uh, computationalism cannot self-correct if you if you if you stick to 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 always applying it it's almost like you can never really escape from it from within that's what i'm trying to say now um the contrast between adaptationism and computationalism uh and inaction well i think they're obvious uh, we already said it instead of a dependent environment we have a co-dependent environment which is dependent with the organism or the cognizer. Instead of problem solving, we have natural drift, which is the proposal that I'm going to talk about in a minute, about how to look at evolution. Instead of optimality, you look at viability. Essentially, natural selection does exist and does occur, but it's essentially just taking away anything that is non-viable, as opposed to prescribing what must have, must be the case. You know, Instead of saying, you all have to reach this peak, it's okay if you stay on this on this plateau, but if you fall off the plateau, well, no, that's not okay. Uh, instead of modularity, you have an entanglement. You saw the quote by Susan Oyama, there are all these systems that are in the process itself, distinguishing itself as system and environment, changing those relations over time and so on at different levels in a hierarchy. Uh, so you have a relational perspective instead of an internalist perspective. There is no genetic cause of anything. The genes participate in an entangled set of relations, a dance. And therefore, the best way to understand this is non-linearly and non-reductively in terms of emergence and at the, across different scales. So that would be the, the main contrast. And this is one of the main messages of, of the chapter. Now, I said natural drift, what is it? Uh, essentially, it's a way of trying to put all of these criticisms in, in a positive manner. It starts, I mean, it begins with the, in, in, the, in the work in autopoiesis and cognition already, uh, when they look at evolution and reproduction as subordinated to the condition of autopoiesis and so on and so forth, uh, and structural coupling. Um, and it's developed a bit further in the tree of knowledge and in the embodied mind as well. So the, the main 
ideas is that you have a theory that is centered on the organism, not in the genes, not in the environment externally, as opposed to in problems and so on. And, and you understand both ontogeny and evolution as the outcomes of plastic structural coupling. And that allows you, essentially structural coupling means, if you reminder here, is that the, the modifications that an organism might go through without losing its autonomy, without losing its autopoiesis. Uh, and that means there are multiple pathways. This can happen in multiple ways. It, it, as the authors say, they want to switch from a prescriptive logic, no, yeah, yeah a prescriptive logic that tells you what to, what is the right thing to a proscriptive logic to tell you do not do that, but you can do anything else. Uh, and that is, instead of uh, optimality or optimization, the metaphor is the metaphor of satisficing, which is this portmanteau between satisfying and sufficing, uh, which, by the way, it was introduced by Herbert Simon. Uh, so just to make it, you know, sure that sometimes you know he is if you like the father of cognitivism or, or in some way and, and but he introduced this idea that is being picked up uh here you know in his uh, analysis of economic behavior um organisms agents having a non-reductive perspective at, i already said the organism environment core specification and selections may happen at different levels of self-organization this i think is a, something a new tweak introduced in the embodied mind is not so obvious to me in, in the tree of knowledge that it can be dif different levels of selection. Uh, what might it miss? Well, I believe that this is more than a theory of evolution. It's a framework for theories of evolution because it tells you, well, as long as you, your hypothesis, your mechanism, your proposal fits this global you know, constraints, it is a case of natural drift. Uh, it's not so much telling us, well, this is how novelty happens. Uh, unless you, you you end up saying it in such a general way that you're not saying much, it's too general for that. So you had you lack the explanatory tools for dealing with the multiple factors at these many levels and, and each specific case. There are issues about what is actually drifting, the, the structure of the whole organism, the relation of the organism and the environment, some molecular you know process etc there, there are issues there about clarifying this these levels of drift uh as well as disentangling this uh, different kinds of conservation variation and inheritance in that sense the evolution in four dimensions book by uh chablonka and, and lamb that's exactly that i mean it, I, it would be quite quite uh compatible with the idea of natural drift. But natural drift is not telling us that, look, there are some molecular loops that get uh, locked into an attractor and they are inherited from one generation of cell division to another, not by genes. It's, it's just simply uh, part of the metabolism. So it's a molecular inheritance. There's one case. Um, more importantly, there is a sense in which there is uh, the acknowledgement of the material overlap between autopoiesis and autonomy and reproduction, but not so much the organizational overlap in the traditional, so definitely not in the original writings in, in the tree of life and so on. The organization is to just separate, you know, first you have the autopoietic unity, then you can only reproduce it then. But that's a logical relation, not a temporal relation. And, and therefore there the can be organizational aspects of reproduction as many uh, researchers like Alvaro Moreno and, and others are these days uh, exploring that are uh, overlapping with uh, self-production, with autopoiesis. And in that sense, there is an, an evolutionary tree view implied by it, where each, because you're following the structural coupling and changes of, of a particular ontogeny and therefore and events of reproduction, you're essentially following a tree structure. But that has been criticized quite a lot uh, recently because Precisely, that the, the, there are the, the evolution of life doesn't have, seem to have this this tree structure. There are all kinds of horizontal uh, mixing, you know, especially by bacterial horizontal gene transfer and things like that. So I think it, it misses a little bit on that. Um, okay, I think I have to speed up a bit. This is mainly to say uh, Evan Thompson retakes these ideas. He calls it inactive evolution instead of natural drift, but essentially says it is the way in which we understand 
both ontogeny and evolution as the laying down the path in walking. That's that's what's happening at that level. Now, uh, I'm close to, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing so well with time, but uh, the chapter then takes, takes a, a, a little bit of a short turn and starts talking about an active cognitive science and say, well, how do we, taking this, this relation between uh, environment and organisms, how should we understand uh, this at the level of behavior? And uh, they mentioned uh, the ecological approach to perception uh, by James J. Gibson and, and followers as one very interesting and actually quite overlapping perspective in which the, 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 the whole point is that you're uh, inhabiting a particular environment is a, a way in which your activity picks up from this environment relevant structures such as affordances, such as the poss possibilities or impossibilities for your actions and so on and so forth. Now, uh, I would contend that this still has a view in which you have a body and you have an environment. And this is very much the case in which, at least for many Gibsonians, where they insist that what's relevant to the environment is already there in the environment. And, and it's either picked up by the agent or not. Now, all kinds of, of little subtle variations on this, uh, but at least from a, an active perspective, there is an inextricable relation between the uh, body and environment at the level of even the sensory, minimal sensory motor schemes, when we cannot breathe without air. So the air and is constitutive of the breathing action, as is our diaphragm and our lungs, and the oxygen exchange that happens as a consequence. So all of that uh, made us think that, in, in fact, every, every sensory motor loop, everything we do, is uh, a, a coordination, uh, a coming together of environmental and bodily processes. And this we develop in the book Sensory Motor Life. Um, more, for those who are interested, there's a whole nice discussion. This We edited this special issue with, with Marek and uh, Manuel Eras Escribano and Tony Gemero on an action and ecological psychology and the convergence. There are over 30, 30 papers, I think, that are there with different views. And I think it's a different, interesting book. And again, another flash of young people doing interesting and active work. Miguel Sepulveda Pedro, Pedro has written a nice book on an active cognition in place, on the importance of development and in the, the relevance of your environment, the place in which you're surrounded and, and, and the structures of that place, how sense-making is best understood as these developmental and ecological norms. Now, this is the last part of my talk. In the chapter, they mentioned the uh, work on robotics and it says the old AI that came from cybernetics like the, the work of uh, Ross Ashby and uh, Gray Walter was actually much more inactive than, than you would have imagined because they built machines that perform certain actions or certain behaviors but when you looked inside there were not nothing that was instructing them to do so the, the behaviors were emergent and this is uh, Gray Walter had these little robots that could seek the light, that they could interact with each other. And this was in the 1950s. And the homeostat would take me long, too long to explain, but it was, again, a, a machine that produced adaptive behavior without insight, essentially having no intelligent mechanism inside. Now, they do mention uh, and, and discuss Rodney Brooks's uh, work in behavior-based robotics because you know it was very famous in in at the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s and and essentially it was quite revolutionary uh, brooks says instead of having this traditional sandwich perspective like susan harley would say in which you have perception modeling planning representing execution control between the sensors and the actuators what we have are layers of activity moving about without bumping into walls, seeking lights and so on and so forth, that we have to try to integrate together, trying to achieve something like the intelligence of an insect. And it, it ended up creating robots that could behave in the real world quite convincingly in this way. And, he, and you know, the authors say, this is the kind of thing we mean when we talk about 
doing science in an inactive mode, even though Brooks didn't call himself an active. Well, he wouldn't because he was before. And the follow and follow up work uh, evolution of robotics. I should mention this because I, I I think practically all of my ideas come come from working with these people, with uh, Phil Husband, Simon Harvey, and Randall Beer, who have championed a way of looking at autonomous robotics using ideas from evolution, um, but in a way uh, also paying attention to that satisfying uh, uh, lack of constraint. Essentially, instead of saying, oh, we need a robot that does this particular behavior, well, we need a robot that kind of recharges the battery when it needs to, and we don't tell it how. And using an analog to an evolutionary process, you end up actually being able to design in robots that can do that. And then you can investigate, well, how did it solve the problem? Did it have a battery representation that measures the state of the battery? Well, no, actually it did something else. Uh, since I'm inventing this example, I'm not sure that does how, how but, but in many cases, you were always surprised uh, by, by the actual solution found by, by, by this robot. So this is, I think, inactive cognitive science happening. And Rolf Pfeiffer is another something to mention here, was a major figure, still is, um, in embodied robotics. Now, coming to, my, to the end of my talk, the, the, the chapter does say that, okay, this is the way in which an inactive cognitive science would work. And I think it has happened to, to, to a large extent that many of these, these are examples that are by no means the only cases, but if you look at these, these uh, examples, they have tried to advance the idea of uh, an inactive theory, an inactive theory of perception, in the case of Alba Noy, for instance, an inactive theory of language, and an active theory is the relation between organisms and, and sense making, mind and life, and an active theory of action and interaction to different degrees and using different elements of, of the inactive perspective. So it's not just philosophy. Um, and it's not nothing wrong with being just philosophy, but in this case, it's not just philosophy, it's also a science. And all of these ideas uh, have been defined with scientific precision in, in the inactive literature. In most cases, they are operational. That this is a, a constraint that we inherit from Maturana and Varela, trying to make the idea operational. So that it's not just simply an opinion, like, well, you know, uh, like we said, social interaction is when two people are together. No, no, no. But social interaction involves a certain degree of relational autonomy, the participation of autonomous participants that do not lose their autonomy in the process, and so on. That's the definition. So we have done all, all, all this work, not me and many others. So it's important to, to highlight this. We're not this this, this is a, a body of scientific uh, theory there that is quite strong. And if you're interested in, in science in the traditional mode, if you're a Popperian, you, you may ask, well, okay, well, how do you prove that these ideas work? Well, sometimes you can. So if you take the idea of participatory sense making that we developed with Hannah de Jager. Uh, later, we developed that idea into a much more uh, or an idea that oriented towards psychology, about whether interaction, uh, social interaction, can be constitutive of co social cognition in some cases. Later, we developed that into a hypothesis for neuroscience, the interactive brain hypothesis that says that processes in the brain dealing with social cognitions of all kinds are related to processes in the brain and dealing with social interaction, even when you're not interacting, even when you're watching a movie. And this was led to discussions with neuroscientists. Uh, I don't know if you can read there, but with uh, Ralph Adolf, his co-author there of a debate about it. And this le leads to experiments. Joy Hirsch actually sets out to prove some of this idea of interactive brain hypothesis uh, in the case of a uh, cross-brain mechanisms you know, measuring uh, two people interacting in case of verbal communication and and so on. So it's just science in the traditional mode. Not that it's the only way you can do science, but I mean, it's the, it's the for those who have a doubt about the possibilities of, of the, all these ideas to be brought down to the level of uh, a, a scientific engagement. So to end, uh, this 
thing about laying down the path and walking sometimes leaves out the fact that there, there are many walkers uh, and therefore that that there are many paths and they interact. So I like this this idea of a river delta as as a metaphor also the, uh, the, because the interactions with if you consider this to be the paths, the interactions between the paths determine also structural constraints about what we can do next. I cannot just lay the path in walking by just walking anywhere. There's some walls over there. There's some issues that have been created by others. I'm not saying that there's an ultimate ground or anything, but the, the other paths are in the way sometimes. And therefore, the idea of a world without grounds, which is the the title of the next part of the book, and it was originally going to be the title of the book, is, I think, well taken. And I think I understand very well that there is no ultimate reality in which we can... We can and this has led to this concept of groundlessness. But I believe that this is just the first step in a negation and that we have to come back to an, with another step. Uh, this may be con some controversial to some of you, but I, I don't think we should stay in groundlessness, at least because the English version of groundlessness is a negative. And I think uh, it would be nice to have a positive, but in fact, since I cannot have a positive, let's have a double negative. Uh, a meshwork of groundless grounds. Because even though there is no ultimate reality, that doesn't mean there are no grounds. It's just that these grounds eventually do are codependent uh, with, with, with others. And therefore, um, I believe that this is actually what the inactive theory says, and what all you know, people like Luontin say, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's only that because we have to highlight the the need to say that uh, to move from the naive realism that said that we have to ultimately look at the reality as it is, and to say no, it's not quite like that. That we have to use the negative and say no, we have ground worlds without grounds. But I believe that eventually what we are saying is we are building the grounds, and there are grounds. So there's no problem. Uh, so that is our reality. Um, and that's a, a, a different understanding, uh, but I think it's implied in the theory. Okay, I'm going to be speaking for too long. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ezekiel. Uh, it was wonderful. So again, kind of re-emphasizing just how dense um, the, the, the riches are. Um, and also, I guess, how many interconnections there are of that and that have developed over the the past 30 years um there's a there's a lot going on and it's good to have both the the, the ground and the, the the constant new making of ground that we've seen as well so to, to have sort of set out some of these other paths we might walk down is great so it's 21 minutes past the hour where i am and i suggest then with maybe we just take those that four minutes to round us out to 25 minutes past the hour might give us a quick opportunity for a, a comfort break and a, a, a drink of water or whatever it is you need. And um, so 25 minutes past the hour, we'll reconvene.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, so a uh, few minutes for um, pause and reflection there and um, people straight in with the hands as well. So uh, we will get straight to the discussion. And Ralph, I believe your hand was up first there. Thanks, Matic. Hi, Ezekiel. Nice to see you again. Hey. Um, nice. Thank you very much for a brilliant um, lecture on all of this. Um, but as you were talking, especially towards the end, I started thinking of the environmental crisis. I started thinking, well, if we're building groundless grounds, it seems to me that we're building a ground and norms that are going to kill us eventually. So how does that fit into the whole idea of niche construction? Because it's kind of counterintuitive that evolution would go in the direction of destruction, unless, of course, it's just one of those things that you mentioned that might be the sort of the meteorite falling and destroying destroying um, dinosaurs or things like that. I mean, just, it seems to be a little bit different from that. I mean, how, how can you how can you fit this in or, or, or you don't think it's relevant? No, it is relevant. It's a good question. Um, one thing to clarify there is that uh, <sighs> You know, extinctions happen. Um, extinction events happen, and sometimes organisms cannot adapt to an environmental change, or, or by a series of accidents, uh, they 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 have, you know, reduced the number of populations and so on, or whatever. So that means that you shouldn't think of of niche construction as having a positive direction. I mean, we try to remain viable, but but that that does, doesn't mean that we. This is guaranteed. And I'm talking this at the broader point of, of the concept in biology, so that, so that you can see a species that is uh, engaging in interesting niche construction and interaction with other species, that species may still go extinct. It doesn't mean that that everything will happen for the, for the best. So this is a, a, a general point. But now, of course, to the specific point of, of, of the environmental crisis, well, of course, I mean, um, I don't know what to say except that I'd repeat what I just said. Maybe who, who says that we are we are really the intelligent beings that we think we are? Um, if if we are able to to not able to really do something about the environmental crisis, about changing the the the, the forms of production, the relations to the to nature, and so on, in such a way that and our our internal relations, our politics, in such a way that uh, we can do something about it. I don't think life in general will, you know, will disappear. I mean, if, <laughs> but you know, it might actually become an a, a, a uninhabitable for us and for many other species. So, in a way, you 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 don't, you you have to dissociate the idea of uh, evolution and the process of evolution with the idea of intelligence. Uh, like, oh, we know what what is really really good for us. Uh, and this is actually not obvious to, thing to do because many intelligent people have done exactly that and say that that there is an idea of rationality to evolution. If something evolves, therefore it's rational. And, and then it has said that before. So um, I don't think it's just the case. And the idea of natural drift might be helpful in to say, well, you know, we try to remain viable, but what if we reach the point where that, plateau gets so narrow that we the next step will be just falling off it so yeah uh you have to allow that possibility theoretically but i'm not really engaging with the other part of the question is like what should we do with the climate crisis i don't know if you have much time for <laughs> for, for that but yeah that's all. thanks ezekiel um okay martina Hi everybody and uh, thanks um, for uh, your wonderful lecture and my question is about the, um, the level of operationality that you were talking about a few minutes ago and uh, you know my question is about the relationship that we can draw between the uh, model that we are developing using maybe different methodologies and the object of investigation that we want to, to model in, in any sense. So uh, especially, I mean, for evolutionary robotics, it's, it's a kind of, um, you know, conundrum because I think that, you know, you have no means to reach 
it's possible to reproduce the evolutionary uh, path that is going on in evolutionary robotics in the in the environment or in real world, let's say. Uh, but it's it's also the case for other kind of models, like for instance in social robotics or um, in this field, let's say. So how you know how could you could you say more about this kind yeah. of relationship? No, I think that's great. Uh, it's very important to I mean we 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 have a habit of thinking in uh, about models that it means that when we make a model, we're trying to approach. A particular phenomenon and it seems obvious you know if you if you model the climate uh you, you try to, to to make an accurate model because you want to make predictions and so on now models do not have only that function um, models can have different functions and uh, sometimes models are tools for thinking and in the case of evolutionary robotics that is almost the main thing that they are for me at least you're not building very useful robots, to be honest, but you are actually using them to reshuffle your concepts and say like, oh, actually, I thought this was important, but it turns out this other thing is as, as important or more important. Oh, wow, I have to rethink. So it's almost like uh, extended, you know, te technologically aided thinking. And that's what models are uh, often. Sometimes models are very simple and very fruitful. In physics, you have... Uh, you know, spin glasses, which are very simple models of things going up and down and interacting, and that's all. Now, this um, doesn't resolve the question of what can the model say about the real system? Well, because the model is not meant to directly say something about the real system. The model is me meant to generate the next step, which would be the, the hypothesis that you can then test on the real system. And when you test it and then you go like, well, the model seems quite useful because it helped me produce this hypothesis and it helped me actually check that seems to be the case in this system, then the model has fulfilled that function. Um, so I wouldn't be uh, too worried about models not approaching reality as such. Uh, I would be worried if the models are pointless, they, they, they don't help you. Um, Eventually, you have to connect to, to the system that you're interested in investigating, but a, a model would never really be accurate in the sense of reproducing the system. For that, you have the actual system. For that, you have the organism and, and so on. The model is meant to try to abstract. It's an abstraction. And so, uh, was there another part of the question? No, I think that, that, that essentially that, that's... By, now, yes, you did say operationality, and I think I have to clarify what I mean there. I mean what, well, uh, Varela uh, and, uh, and Maturana have meant in, in the original work on autopoiesis and also in an active approach, which is you define um, the, the concept in, in, in such a way that it does not involve anything but the system that you're, uh, and the processes that you're discussing at the level that you have chosen to discuss them. So you, you cannot say, for instance, well, uh, this, um, this uh, whatever, this gene um, is, is beneficial for, for such and such you know, reason. Uh, that's non-operational. You have to say this gene produces, is involved in the production of such and such a protein. And then I can tell you the story. That protein tends to be beneficial. About, but the operational language is the language that you can really go and use, use, uh, do experiments with. Um, not all experiments are driven by oper operational language. And in principles of biological autonomy, Francisco Varela does a, has a, a whole chapter on the different discourses in science, operational and symbolic. And I think that that. When I meant operational, I meant operational in that sense. Thanks, Irene, for that. So it, it puts me in mind, actually, one of the things that had crossed my mind while um, just during the break um, was the, the you mentioned the laying down the path in walking um, and that uh, the, your image of the, the river delta, um, for one reason or another, put me in mind of um, desire paths but desire paths within the discipline of cognitive science, essentially, you know, as we 
go about our business as scientists, mm -hmm. some of these things become exciting research areas that lots of people flood into. And then all of a sudden you have lots of theoretical resources and models and so on there. Mm -hmm. And it's just easy to work there and it's easy to walk and you get sort of the, 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 um, the, pro the process of, of cognitive science is filled with desire paths just as much as the, the lawns of a university campus are too. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's sort of interesting to see that, that um, cycling back of, uh, of the, the, the sort of feedback loop of models and, and thinking. And Georgina, you've been very patient there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, Ezequiel. Um, I'm very happy uh, for meeting you. And uh, thank you very much for your great talk. Uh, I have uh, two questions for you that are a little bit unrelated to the current, to the current chapter, but I would like to know your opinion. Uh, well, my, my first question is the following. Uh, what would be your definition of sentience? And my second question is, do you believe uh, hybrid si systems such as Xenobots are capable of exhibiting some form of sentience? Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, my definition of sentience. Well, let's put it this way. Um, if you were to try to use one of the concepts in that, you know, from the active theory there, uh, the closest you come in terms of relevance is the concept of sense making. The idea that that uh, an organism is involved in in a caring existential relation to its surroundings, to the possibilities, to the to the risks of its situation, and therefore. I would say that uh, anything to do with lived experience involves uh, that that relation of caring. Now, sentience often is is conceived as this kind of a, a I mean, a different meanings, but often it's like this minimalistic form form of consciousness uh, that something can feel. Well, it can feel if it cares. Now it, it, it cares not in the necessarily in the human sense in which you you might care about an object, but essentially in the more basic sense of being non-indifferent. Non-indifference and sentience would go together. I'm going to say that not that sentience is non-indifference, but at that minimum level, that would be uh, how I would connect them. Um, now. Uh, yeah, could an, a, a non-biological system or a hybrid system and so on? My, yes, I, 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 not the ones we have these days, uh, because they're not built on on, on that um, requirement of having a precarious life that you have to take care of, of that they have to continue find ways to to continue to uh, exist. They just exist, uh, and when they break, they don't care. Uh, you know. Is the designer who gets frustrated, not the robot. So that means that the 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 we will have to rethink the the way we approach uh, the design of artificial systems or hybrid system, biological, technological, uh, in such a way that then you can say, oh, because it's built in this way, and the inactive theory is telling you what you need to look for, because it's built in this way, because it's autonomous, because it relates to the environment in terms of sense-making, uh, yeah, we can say it is an agent, and maybe we can postulate that that is sentient. Um, so that would be the way to do it. Is possible? Yeah, I don't see why not. Uh, I couldn't say it, 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 that... I mean, if somebody showed me an argument, no, this is why not, within the inactive perspective, I would probably have to listen to that. But I cannot imagine it at the moment, uh, just because of, of, of... There are some arguments that are kind of interesting about why it has to be a biological system having to do with the, the possibility of self-construction uh, at the biological level, the, the, for, the, form, the kind of molecular recombinations that you can have and then that uh, you have processes that can act as operators and as operands you know and constraints to each other recursivity all happening at that molecular level that you say you have to do it at this level because at the macroscopic level you don't have that that sort of relation well might be 
But in sensory motor life, in the book, we propose that perhaps what happens is that you you engage at a different uh, in a different kind of agency, like a sensory motor autonomy, not a biological autonomy. You could have a sensory motor agent that is not biological in principle. At least, I cannot see the obstacle. Uh, I may not be able to see the obstacle, and there is one, but at the moment, I cannot see it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ezekiel. I wonder, actually, just um, I might ask you to say a little bit more about the relationship of sense making and this notion of um, concern or um, non neutrality, and the extent to which, though, that logic um, is sort of the the same, or whether there's a the, there's a sort of a break or a change in it between the evolutionary domain and the behavioral one. So you, you introduced in your talk this parallel between the two. Um, mm. And in evolution, it's just don't die. Uh, everything else is fair game. But in, in any given situation in which a person or a living animal is behaving, um, it's, it's not necessarily that there's a single optimal outcome, um, but it certainly it seems the case that it's not simply that there's a prescriptive perimeter. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a sort of a complexity or a scale issue there. And I guess is the, um, what are the, the best resources to use to, to grasp that difference? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a very good question. And it's, it's one of the few criticisms of the, of the inactive theory that I thought this is a serious, important criticism, but it's similar to what you say, and I related to what um, Nathaniel Barrett uh, once criticized about the idea of sense making, uh, because it, this is a whole technical argument, but the, the idea of sense making requires a, a, a precarious autonomous process uh, system that, that is its existence is not given. It must be acting in the world in order to continue. But it also requires adaptivity, the, the, the possibility of, of um, accessing uh, some something about how well it is doing. Uh, because it's not just simply the fact that you're viable that tells you that you're doing well. You know, if you fall off a cliff, you're viable until, until the very last second, right? So, but essentially something went wrong already uh, at the beginning of that, that action. Now, the, 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 so you need activity in order to tell you ways to measure, and, and I'm using these words like measure and monitor that are very high level, but in a way it's simply being sensitive to uh, these this possibilities and so on. Now that is also a prescript, no, proscriptive logic. That is to say, do, remain viable, only do it in this intelligent way, or yeah, just to put it in that way. Uh, so uh, Nathaniel Barrett said, what about positive values? What about that, the fact that we, I like chocolate more than something else? Uh, can, can we also explain them in this way? And it's true. I mean, you, if just by looking at, at the boundaries of what you should avoid, you cannot tell why is it that you would prefer something over this other thing when in principle they're both viable? Now, the whole thing is that when, when you look at, at, at uh, all this layering of, of, of uh, regulations in, in the body, that you have organic, sensory, motor, social regulation, it turns out that anything that was a flat landscape at one level becomes a, a different landscape at another level. So you, you develop habits that start self-sustaining and therefore... That explains why you prefer the chocolate to an, an, another sweet thing. Uh, and uh, and therefore, you say, well, both are viable, but um, I, I still have a preference. And, and therefore, you, you, you can tell stories in which essentially the same logic applies at different, at different, I don't like the word levels, because they're all entangled in the end, but at, at different forms of autonomy. Uh, so that is the... The, the the a quick answer I suspect is not a full answer uh, because there must be some something else concerning positive values and positive caring. Now, interestingly, the when you look go back to antiquity and you look at the Stoics, they have these concepts of oikiosis, 
which essentially is something like self-concern. And they say animals have it. Uh, they, 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 they concern about continuing to be what they are. Plants have it. And then they extend this okayosis into like, oh, they concern for their offsprings and, and they concern for their environment. And we humans, because we are rational, whatever, we are, well, we should be concerned for a whole society and so on. So, so essentially their ethics was uh, take your self-concern and, and just expand it because you are part of this larger self. And that's an interesting way to put it. And I've been for a long time trying to, to, to put these two ideas together, the, 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 at least contrast them because they're not identical, the ideas of caring and sense-making, of non-indifference. And the idea of okiosis, because the okiosis has a more positive uh, um, angle to you, you care for something. Um, I think it's work to be done. Uh, I'm not sure I have a full answer there. Thanks. I, I would um, easily get sucked in this rabbit hole, but other hands have come up, so I'm going to have to move away. Um, but uh, thank you very much for that. We might follow up with that some other time. Uh, Mario, your hand was up next. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ezekiel. I find this. Um, the parallel between the adaptationist program in biology and the um, cognitivist program in psychology is extremely important to, to, to take in parallel as we did here today. Um, the, you listed a lot of criticisms to the adaptationist program um, that are, so that's, that's an ongoing discussion within biology. And the people who are push, putting these things forward they are biologists working in departments of biology, and they are struggling to make themselves um, uh, heard. Uh, the, these ideas, they have become increasingly more influential, but they are, most of the work in biology still re, is still expressing nature and nurture, is still expressing ideas of uh, genetic determinism uh, uh, and so on. So it's really not easy to move, to, to change our mindset. But the biologists who are doing that, they have, uh, they are going to conferences, they are doing experiments in, 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 in labs and they're trying to publish. In the cognitive sciences, the two approaches that I'm aware of that are radically different from the cognitivist perspective are ecological psychology and inaction. The ecological psychologists, they have an international, an international society. They run uh, conferences every year. We don't have that for the inactive approach, which you have showed a few examples of empirical work that are trying to translate these ideas into um, experiments and, and empirical studies. But it's still so little that is available, especially to support new researchers, early career researchers, young researchers who may be interested in, in, mm. uh, in doing studies uh, consistent with this approach. I, I'm obviously thinking of myself, I would really like that my career as an empirical researcher is consistent with, inact with inactive approach and with ecological psychology, but I'm in a, in, a, in a department where everyone else is playing a different game. And if I'm going to collaborate with my with my colleagues, if I'm going to get money to keep doing, to, if I'm going to be accepted as a postdoc in a group, I just have to play that game, um, and then I have to somehow try to sneak in, uh, to try to bring ideas into the project that I'm working on. But and th there's a guilt that comes with that because I'm sort of selling my soul <laughs> in a sense. I, I cannot do a full. Uh, like a uh, like a fully fleshed and uh, inactive project, but I, so okay. So I'm expressing my frustration. If we are going, if we want to this approach to thrive and expand and become more influential, what is it that you guys, <laughs> the established researchers, Mind and Life Institute, uh, what? What do we you need to do to to support the newer generations, me included, uh, to expand this? So that's a bit what I'm that I'd like to bring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very important points there, and I I think 
the, the, the problem is that there's a whole mixture of factors. It's not just the ideas that are relevant in, in determining that, I mean, what, whether um, a particular approach becomes more mainstream or not, whether he wishes to become more mainstream or not, and so on and so forth. There are issues to do precisely with institutions, funding procedures, uh, and so on. And, 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 and so we will have to have a whole list of things that are relevant there that, that to discuss about that. But to try to, to give some, some idea, I, I totally sympathize with what you're saying, uh, but uh, about you being in an environment where you are, you're like the undercover and activist. Um, so that's that's okay. You know, uh, it, it, you shouldn't feel guilty about that. In fact, what you should do is is, is to, to keep questioning your certain the, the people that sometimes come with these other ideas and say, like, but look, have you considered this problem? I think it's a serious problem. Uh um, maybe you have to be a bit sneaky about it and say, no, this is an active perspective. It's more like this is a question I have. I mean, how can you? say that whatever this represents that i mean exactly how i always think like whenever you, you push any anybody for instance in the case of representations you need to push you try to tell me exactly how and why do you call it a representation in many cases it's like you know it's you know like the the subprime mortgages that were packaged and repackaged and re, you know just repeated and sold all around provided nobody asks how you cash it out well okay every now and then you you should ask how you cash it out you should ask that difficult question this doesn't solve at all the larger problems that you say like you know how do you get funding you know how, but i have to say i mean it, it it's it's not as bleak as you might imagine because if, if you're interested in certain topics uh, so you start developing, you know, in psychology and you start working as a postdoc and um, and you get deeper into the topic that you're investigating and, and you, you know, get some publications there. Eventually, at some point, you will be more able to decide for yourself in which direction you're taking your research. So eventually, at some point, you might have to play the game a bit of, of, of uh, it's not even quite playing the game. It's just doing science it's, and, and, and you have to take it also seriously in that sense. But uh, you can then say, well, you know, I investigated this and I published some papers that, okay, now I think I would take a turn in this direction now, different from what I did in the past, because I believe it's more interesting. And that will be your decision eventually. Uh, and that will be the way to manage it. Not, do not feel frustrated and uh, or feel that you have to, you know, change the world one, you know, uh, difficult question at a time. What you have to do is also to, you know, this this thing here is happening, new participation and, and discussions and so on is, 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 is part of it. I mean, so you know that not, not lots of other people also have similar concerns and similar ideas. So that's the way I would do it. Uh, I'm sure others will have a, other suggestions on this very broad and important topic. Thank you, Ezekiel. Yeah, it's, I think we're brought back to Max Planck's dictum that science advances one funeral at a time. And um, there is simply, a, a as medical technology gets better, science is going to go slower. Um, but nevertheless, we can be patient and, and sort of acknowledge the realities of it a little bit. But um, it, it's this isn't a, um, a problem that's unique to, to the inactive approach in a lot of, I mean, in essence, in, in a great many different disciplines and yeah. a, a great many different problems. This is the, the, the just the inertia of the scientific mm. sociology, really. Um, but um, but it does mean that the future is always brighter, right? That's we can mm. look hopefully towards uh, a time when you guys are in more charge. Um, okay, so uh, Hong Yu, you want to come in there? Thank you for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask you when you say um, like habits and how it has like an autonomous kind of um, it's almost sounds like it has its own kind of concern and care. And then earlier you said so sort of concern ties with sentience. So then you can say like you have a bunch of different sentences within yourself because of like different tendencies yeah. uh, but then when you when you experience the world it's really just like one single kind of agency 
Um, so like, is there a way for coordinating them? Okay, that's interesting. I will immediately ask, is it one single kind of agency or is it that you're perhaps, you know, bringing forward uh, into the situation different aspects of uh, multiplicity of agencies? Um, um, I'm not going to say anything too strong, but in, in a way there is a sense in which our agency is modulated by what we're doing uh, to the point sometimes that you might call it, you know, strangely a different kind of agency, sometimes contradictory. And this is often happens at the social level when you say, uh, this person is so kind and so friendly and so on, and yet so strict uh, with their children. Why, you know, how, what, what is that different relation? How, how is it happening? It's almost like they're two different people. Uh, so in, there, there is a sense, okay, I don't want to say that every every autonomous system as such uh, is already sentient. It had to have all these other aspects of adaptivity, sense-making. It has to be a body of some kind. Now, the question is that, our, our bodies have different kinds of regulation and, and different different dimensions of embodiment, and in uh, and they're not all in sync. They are often in contradiction. You know, ask anybody who tries to quit smoking um, how easy it is to do it. You know, if you, rationally they can think like, okay, it makes this is bad for my health. Um, the organic body says, yeah, it is bad for for our health. And the habitual body says, well, actually, it's quite nice. Uh, I don't mind smoking. So that is uh, the navigation and negotiation that we're always doing in, in building our bodies along these different dimensions. And this is not just the message from the inactive approach. I mean, some anthropologists have looked into this, like Anne-Marie Moll. In fact, she uses the word inactive bodies. But it's interesting because it's not a very direct connection to, to the inactive approach. I mean, there is some connection. But essentially, she's saying that they were constantly negotiating and constructing our bodies at different dimensions, uh, such as when we have to make trade-offs, when we have to go undergo a treatment that is long-term for a particular disease. She studied um, diabetes, I believe. And then you have to say, well, should I go for this sort of trade-off because it would change even just this change in my lifestyle? Should I go for that other option? And therefore, what you're doing is just shaping your agencies, I would like to even say, even though, yeah, you, you're right about the question of like, how are all these connected? Are they integrated? In what way? Uh, is it because there is an overlap between them? Hmm. In linguistic bodies, we say that linguistic agency is, in fact, is paradoxical because it's made out of our incorporated utterances that we, you know, we, we just get ways of speaking that we incorporate. But in incorporated utterances and ways of speaking, we, we are actually also enacting other agents, you know, and people can tell that. They can say, like, oh, this is something your dad used to say. Why, why are you saying that? And, and that that is is the paradox that there there, there are agencies that keep emerging um, and therefore you might conclude from that that there are also different levels or, or different directions of concern uh, associated with those agencies. But it's it's a navigation that we make with our, with our bodies of trying to 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 do not disperse in such a way that we eventually become you know we end up having a mental mental breakdown. Uh, with the mind shattered, or we not not to try to unify in such a way that we remove anything that doesn't follow a particular line, a particular one kind of agency. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm answering your question at this at this level because I think that we could go to the level of habits too, and so on and so forth. But essentially, I think that's where where your maybe your question is about. Uh, yeah, because yeah. I associate. Uh, sentience with also consciousness so then if you posit different kind of sentience would you also say it, it's possible to have different consciousness or is it well like... i would say that for instance if you take the example of, of the, somebody trying to quit smoking uh the habit has 
uh, a particular autonomy, a particular way of trying to remain alive, to put it metaphorically, uh, and that is manifested in your sentience, in the way you integrate that into your sentience, and it's manifested as a tension. It's manifested about like, oh, it's how difficult it is to do this. Um, and so it's not that it has, you know, there's a creature over there called the habit that is sentient. No, no, it's, it's part of you, but it's, it's, it's part of your dimensions of sentience that are manifested in, in, in at different moments, in different times, to different degrees. So uh, I wouldn't, that's why I say that I wouldn't think that you have a unified uh, consciousness in, in that same sense, although we do try to unify it in a narrative sense, but that's a different story. Um, well, thank you both. Uh, that's a, a lovely note on which to bring the process to a close. We allow our, our um, various agencies to separate and, and go their separate ways, pretty much perfectly on time. So very nicely done there. Well, every, well, congratulations, everybody. Um, so I will. it just remains for me to say thank you again, um, Ezekiel, very much for um, your, your presentation and for the discussion and um, for the richness of it, both in terms of opening up the chapter to us and then um, examining some of the issues and the, the follow-up. In a couple of weeks, we will be exploring chapter 10, uh, The Middle Way with Jay Garfield. So again, no, no better guide through the middle way than, than there. And uh, we very much look forward to that. Um, I'll just double check if there are any other operational or administrative um, announcements needed before we finish up. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, yes, once again, um, Ezekiel, for this absolutely phenomenal presentation. Um, so yes, as, as you just said, Marek, we'll, we'll be meeting here, same, uh, sorry, different time, actually, this is important to note. Um, so for our next session on Wednesday, November 8th, we'll be meeting at 5 p.m. Central European time, um, so that we can accommodate um, Dr. Jay Garfield's uh, teaching schedule. So it'll be from 5 to 7 p.m. Central European time. And then um, our second uh, session of November will be on Wednesday, November 22nd. We'll be back to, to 6 p.m. with um, Roshi Joan Halifax for the final chapter of The Embodied Mind. So see you all back in two weeks at 5 p.m. And thank you so much again, Mark, for your fantastic hosting, as always, and Ezekiel for lending us your, your time and your, your wisdom this evening. Thank Have you. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs>